Good morning and welcome to New Hanover County Schools The Morning Show. I'm Rachel Glue. And I'm Shannon Maines. This is the week of February 23rd through March 1st. This week our show focuses on outer space. We have black hole trivia, a feature on constellations, and a special space edition of What's Up in Science. And at the end of the show, Rachel and I will compete in a fun game exploring the solar system. In addition, today we finish out the month of February with our last episode in the series of the history of black achievement in America. And we have a new episode of Green Revolution. This week they take us to Arizona where we learn about new ways to use solar power. It's going to be a fantastic show. But for now, let's check in with our news anchor who is standing by with your, school, with your look at your school news headlines. Good morning. Good morning, Rachel and Shannon, and welcome everyone to Your School News here on The Morning Show. Topping the headlines this week, February Board of Education meeting notes, Anderson Elementary Teachers wins a national grant from Shape America, and North Carolina Teacher of the Year presents a mini workshop for teachers. I will have all those stories and more coming up later in the show. We get things going today with a staple here on The Morning Show with a segment we call This Week in History. Our Grand Master of Historical Knowledge has all the headlines from the past times in This Week in History, brought to you by Kidsville News. Welcome to This Week in History. I'm your historical host, Samantha Klein, covering all the colorful and amazing events that have left their mark on history's timeline. This is the week of February 23rd through March 1st. February 23rd, 1945. During the bloody battle for Iwo Jima, U.S. Marines take the island's highest peak and most strategic position and raise the U.S. flag. Marine photographer Louis Lowry was with them and recorded the event. February 24th, 1990. Iraq Kuwait, Kuwait, its tiny oil-rich neighbor, and within hours had occupied most strategic positions in the country. One week later, Operation Shield, the American defense of Saudi Arabia, began as U.S. forces massed in the Persian Gulf. Three months later, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution authorizing the use of force against Iraq if it failed to withdraw from Kuwait. February 25, 1870, Haram Rhodes Revels, a Republican from Natchez, Mississippi, is sworn into the U.S. Senate, becoming the first African American to sit in Congress. February 26, 2007. In an effort to raise awareness of environmental issues, the Honda F1 team unveils its Earth car. It was a race car with a large image of the planet instead of the typical advertising and sponsorship logos featured on most F1 vehicles. February 27, 1960, the underdog U.S. Olympic hockey team defeats the Soviet Union in the semifinals at the Winter Games in Squaw Valley, California. The next day, the U.S. beat Czechoslovakia to win its first ever Olympic gold medal in hockey. Finally, your weekend history tidbits. February 28, 2013, 85-year-old Pope Benedict XVI officially resigns citing advanced age as the reason for giving up his post as the leader of the 1.2 billion members Roman Catholic Church. Benedict was the first pontiff to relinquish power in nearly 600 years. March 1, 1692. The Salem witch hunt, witch hunt begins in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tutu Ba, an Indian slave, are charged with the illegal practice of witchcraft. Later that day, Tutuba, possibly under coercion, confessed to the crime, 
Authorities then began to seek out more Salem witches. That's This Week in History, your ultimate source for those key moments in time. I'm Samantha Klein, thanks for stopping by. This Week in History is brought to you by Kidsville News, a fun and effective learning resource for children, teachers, and parents. It features school news, information, and local community events while promoting literacy and the development of good reading habits, character traits, and study skills in young children. And Kidsville News is always free. Copies are delivered every month to every elementary school in the new Hanover County School, Lib school System. And join us again next time for another journey through time as we explore the fun, fascinating, entertaining, educational facts that make up this week in history. Now don't go away, we'll be right back. Malcolm, you do know that energy savers last six times longer than ordinary light bulbs. This isn't my room. It, it's, it's Baron Davis's. Baron Davis, the basketball player? This is his room? Yep. Interesting, because we have Baron Davis right here. Baron, do you live here? No. I don't mean that, Baron Davis. Millions of kids are using their energy wisely. What's your excuse? Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Rachel Glue. And I'm Shannon Maines. Nearly everyone from the dawn of man has looked up to the sky at night in wondrous awe. Take away the city's lights and you, have, you will see hundreds of stars across the sky. Some of them shine brighter while others appear to group together. The grouping of stars into constellations has been traced back as early as 1300 BC. Many of the earliest constellations were labeled by the Greeks and they defined the zodiac and named as up to an additional 20. Today there are currently 88 constellations recognized by the International Astronomical Union. This morning we have a special on some of the most popular northern hemisphere constellations including their story and how to find them. Constellations have been a part of sky gazing for thousands of years. Finding and connecting the stars which form a constellation is a fun and rewarding experience. However, finding a constellation is not always an easy thing. The time of year and latitude you are at can all affect what constellations you see. Along with finding and seeing constellations, many have a story that goes along with them, while many others have their own legend. Here are some fun constellations which can be found in the Northern Hemisphere and their story. Orion is probably the most popular because of how easy he is to find. Orion is found in the Northern Hemisphere in the winter. He is most easily identifiable by three stars which go across his midsection called Orion's Belt. Orion is also known as Orion the Hunter. It was first identified in early Mesopotamia around the time of Babylon. In Greek legend, Orion is the son of Poseidon. Orion also has a relation to a few other constellations, one of which is the constellation Scorpius. The legend says that Scorpius was sent to kill Orion after he annoyed one of the gods. It is, however, argued over which god Orion angered. When Scorpius rises in the east, Orion sets, which some believe symbolizes Scorpius' victory over Orion. Arguably, the most famous constellation is the Little Dipper. The Little Dipper is one of the first constellations many kids are taught and can be used to find compass directions, as well as many other constellations, such as the Big Dipper. The Little Dipper is just part of a larger constellation called Ursula Minor. The Little Dipper once was part of Draco the Dragon's Wing, but was eventually moved to Ursula Minor to help Greek sailors navigate easier. The Little Dipper can most easily be identified by the North Star, which is the last star nearest the edge of its handle. Perseus is one of the lesser known constellations but can still be found in the Northern Hemisphere during autumn. He is easiest to find around midnight. Legend states that Perseus was the son of Zeus and a great warrior. However, he was also the person who fulfilled many prophecies and some of those prophecies talked about the death of kings. When Perseus was a child, he and his mother were cast out to sea, but were saved by fishermen. Perseus grew to be a great warrior and is forever immortalized in the sky next to his wife Andromeda. 
he slayed famous monsters such as Medusa the Gorgon. Virgo is another well-known Northern Hemisphere constellation. However, Virgo's legend is a bit more complicated. Researchers aren't completely sure which goddess Virgo identifies with. Some believe she is Persephone, the daughter of the goddess of harvest who was taken to the underworld. Others believe she is the goddess of justice, and a nearby constellation is the scales of justice. Virgo can most easily be identified by following the curve of the handle of the Big Dipper. Capricornus is a very famous constellation which is also known as the Sea Goat. He is most closely related with Pan, the god of the countryside. Capricornus is most commonly depicted as having his, a torso of a fish and the lower body of a goat. He is meant to represent the god Pan while in the middle of a transformation from goat to fish. The constellation is found in the early evening in the fall and close to the southern horizon. The Hydra is a well-known monster in Greek mythology, but less well-known as a constellation. The Hydra was a massive multi-headed snake who, if one of his heads was chopped off, would grow two more to replace it. The Hydra was eventually defeated by Hercules. The Hydra can be hard to miss in the night sky as it is both the largest and longest constellation. Since it is so big, Hydra takes six hours to fully rise above the horizon. Look for Hydra's zigzag lines of 17 stars raising up into the sky. These are just a few of the constellations you can find in the night sky, and a brief overview of their stories. Use these constellations as a start to your sky gazing, and soon you'll find there's so much more to discover. Finding constellations can be a fun family activity, especially if you are camping out or traveling outside the range of city lights. There are many different sky guides you can use, from apps to books to printable maps. Don't forget to search for planets and other viewable object in, objects in space as you find the constellations. Alright, it's time now to send it over to the news desk for more of your school news. Good morning and welcome to your school news on The Morning Show. I'm Dylan Grace. Topping our newscast this week are the board notes. The Board of Education held their monthly meeting on Tuesday, February 10th at the Board of Education Center. YSN reporter Raven Smith has all our board notes this month. This month's Board of Education meeting was quick and to the point, with two reporters and a small number of new business items. Let's get right to the board notes for February. The meeting began with recognition of achievement. The board recognized Hogger Jr. Caroline Bunting for winning the American Legion Constitutional Speech Contest and Williston students for taking first place in National Stock Market Game. Dr. Markley presented a candidate for assistant principal for Holly Shelter Middle School, and the board approved this recommendation. Under information, two in-depth reports were given. Elizabeth Feltz from New Hanover High School gave the board an overview of progress made with the school service learning classes. Then Bill Hance, superintendent of operations for the school system, reviewed ne needed adjustments to the attendance zones for next year. The adjustments are minor and the board will vote on them next month. The superintendent's report to the board covered the next steps in the process for naming the new elementary school in Northeast and requested requests from Legion Stadium to help in financially in upgrades to sound system and scoreboards at the stadium. Under old business, the school system's attorney, Wayne Buller, discussed the resolution the board is sending to Raleigh, requesting local control of the school calendars. There were only two items under new business and renewal of the Solution Tree Agreement and approval of items scheduled to be sold as surplus. The next regular Board of Education meeting will be Tuesday, March 3, 2015 at 5.30 p.m. at the Board of Education Center, 1805 South 13th Street. As always, if you cannot attend the meeting in person, you can watch the rebroadcast re Tuesday nights at 6 p.m., Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., Friday mornings at 8 a.m., and Sundays at 1 p.m. Boarding meetings can also be watched online at www.nhcs.net. 
That's your board notes for February. Back to you. Curtis Fallon, a physical education teacher at Edwin Anderson Elementary School, is receiving one of only 13 National Heart Jump Rope for Heart Hoops for Heart grants given from Shape America Society of Health and Physical Educators. Mr. Fallon will be recognized on March 19th at an award ceremony during the Shape America National Convention and Expo in Seattle. The $2,500 grant includes a U.S. Games gift certificate to enhance Fallon's PE program, a free one-year membership to Shape America, as well as expenses paid for travel and registration to the National Convention. Recipients are recognized for their passion and commitment for physical education and the Jump Rope for Heart program. The jointly sponsored Shape America and American Heart Association program promotes physical education and provides children with knowledge of heart diseases and stroke. Mr. Fallon focuses on cardiovascular fitness with skill development in his PE program, as well as teaching students the fundamentals of choosing healthy choices in life. School-wide incentives have been a large part of his jump rope for heart success. New Hanover County Schools is now accepting enrollment applications for kindergarten, year-round grades, and magnet schools. With a complete report on all this year's options is YSN reporter Kathy Kale. New Hanover County Schools will hold kindergarten registration from March 2nd through the 13th. Kindergartners must be registered at the school within their residence attendance area. Attendance areas may be verified by contacting Student Support Services at 251-2929. Children to be registered must be five years of age on or before August 31, 2015. It is not necessary to bring your child to the school for registration. The registration will take approximately 15 minutes. To enroll the child in kindergarten, parents must present the following. Proof of residence, a copy of a lease, deed, property tax or homeowner's insurance policy will do. Utility bill will not be accepted. The child's birth certificate, a certified original will also need to be presented. Certified birth certificates may be obtained by writing or calling the Vital Records Branch in Raleigh or by visiting the Vital Records Branch at 225 North McDowell Street. They may also be obtained from the Register of Deeds office in the county of the child's birth. Parents will be required to bring a health assessment report showing a physical examination, vision screening, and hearing screening. Finally, an immunization record showing the child has received the required immunizations will need to be presented. North Carolina state law requires all the following immunization on the screen for all children enrolling in kindergarten or first grade for the first time. Parents or legal guardians with questions concerning kindergarten registration may call the elementary school in their residential school district or Student Support Services at 251-2929. In addition to kindergarten registration, New Hanover County Schools will open the application process for year-round magnet school and open choice school grade one through five from March 16th through April 24th. Applications are available online at all schools and at the School Systems Administration Building on Carolina Beach Road. For more information, you can call Denise Angevine, Enrollment Specialist at 910-251-2929 or Leanne Graves in Student Support at 910-254-4292. Reporting for your school news, this is Kathy Kale. For all the latest on New Hanover County Schools, join us weekdays at 5.30 p.m. here on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 and Charter Cable Channel 191 for your school news, a complete half hour of all the latest news and information from New Hanover County Schools. Now back to our hosts. Thanks. This week, in honor of Black History Month, we finished our series of features titled The History of Black Achievement in America. The Untold Story of Blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. Each week this month, we are proud to feature one of these stories here on The Morning Show.
The 60s were a time of great upheaval and change in America. One of those changes was that for the first time, the U.S. began to recognize the excellence of its black community, which it had kept downtrodden for so long. But it was also a time of change in the black community itself. A change brought on by using more effective strategies for dealing with the hundreds of years of inequality. The leader of one of these strategies was Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 2nd, 1908. He graduated from Pennsylvania's Lincoln University in 1930 and received his law degree from Howard University in 1933 graduating first in his class. He returned to Baltimore and practiced law there, specializing in civil rights cases. It was during this time that he developed his Marshall Plan. It was a plan to use the courts to accomplish what politics had so egregiously failed to do, becoming the chief of the NAACP's legal defense section in 1936. He was able to put this plan to the test over the next 20 years, Thurgood Marshall argued 32 cases before the Supreme Court, winning 29, including his greatest triumph, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, in 1954. The purpose of arguing the school segregation cases. This case permanently ended the doctrine of separate but equal schools. Marshall's brilliance, both as a lawyer and as a strategist, brought him to the attention of John F. Kennedy. President Kennedy named Marshall an Associate Justice of the Federal Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York in 1961. Then in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson appointed Marshall Solicitor General of the United States. And in 1967, at age 59, Marshall became the first black justice of the U.S. Supreme Court a position he held for 24 years. During his time on the nation's highest bench, he was known for championing civil rights and protecting all Americans, men, women, children, prisoners, and the homeless. He was also a great defender of the First Amendment's freedom of the press and speech. Interestingly, Marshall rejected Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent protests as rhetorical fluff that produced no permanent change, and Malcolm X's talk of a separate black nation as racist craziness in the multiracial society America had become. Marshall sought legal solutions that provided equal rights and opportunities for all Americans based on integration. After his death in 1993, the Washington Afro-American magazine eulogized him with these words. We make movies about Malcolm X. We get a holiday to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But every day, we live with the legacy of Justice Thurgood Marshall. That concludes our special month-long series. We hope you enjoyed it. Now don't go away. This rip-roaring edition of The Morning Show will continue right after this break. But before we go, our trivia question for the day. Black holes are a spot in space where gravity's pull is so strong not even light can escape. They are found throughout the universe and even right here in our Milky Way galaxy. Black holes are very popular in science fiction, from movies to books to TV shows, but there's still a lot to learn about them in the real world. Scientists continue to discover more and more about black holes and their role in our universe. Black holes are the center of our trivia question today. It asks, how many known types of black holes are there? A, just one, B, three, C, seven, or D, 10. We'll have the answer when we return. Indiana's Booth Tarkington looked at life in a different way. Tarkington's Willie Baxter is amusing as he woos Lola Pratt in 17. In his more serious works, The Turmoil and The Magnificent Ambersons, Tarkington showed the effect of industrial growth on residents of quiet, pleasant cities. This background in literature has been brought to you by New Hanover County Schools. 
Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Rachel Glue, and my co-host is Shannon Maines. Space takes center stage on our show today. And before, we, and before the break, we asked our trivia question, which was about black holes. The trivia question asks, how many known types of black holes are there? A, just one, B, three, C, seven, or D, 10? And the correct answer is B, three. There are primordial, stellar, and supermassive, and each type is based off size. Primordial black holes are the smallest kind and range in size from one atom's size to a mountain mass. They are believed to be formed by the extreme density of matter present during the universe's early expansion. Stellar black holes, the most common type, are up to 20 times more massive than our own sun. They are created when a giant star collapses into a supernova. Supermassive black holes are thought to be at the center of the galaxy and more than one million times more massive than the sun. How these are formed is, not, is still being examined. Because light cannot escape a black hole, they were not discovered until X-ray astronomy started. The first one was officially discovered in 1971. Shifting gears now, we feature an edition of the award-winning Green Revolution. This series takes a look at new ways science and technology provide the necessary foundation for our future in the, way, in the world powered by clean energy. In today's episode, we travel to Arizona where we get plenty of sunlight. Researchers there are working hard to turn the energy into electricity we can use, testing new materials that will allow us to build smaller, cheaper, flexible photovoltaic solar cells that can go almost anywhere. So here's the sun, right? It's about 93 million miles away from the Earth. It's big, and it's got a lot of energy. Light is how energy moves through space. But the snag is, when light hits the Earth, the energy is all spread out. So we have to figure out how to collect it and concentrate it so we can use it. To get lots of power, we use solar farms. On some farms, thousands of mirrors focus sunlight to heat pipes filled with fluid. On others, rotating mirrors aim the sun's rays at a liquid-filled tank at the top of a tower. Both convert heat energy to electricity using a generator. And then there are huge farms of solar cells, collecting the sun's energy and turning it directly into electricity. But solar cells can work on a smaller scale, too, powering everything from street lights to houses to stores, even airports. But what about flexible cells that go where you go? Then you could charge your cell phone while you're on your way to meet a friend. Researchers at Arizona State University are looking to the solar experts, plants, to see if we can make solar cells that work better with your life. Brad, can you tell me a little bit about what kind of research you're doing in your lab? Our group likes to focus on the first steps of photosynthesis, where plants take light and start converting it into energy. In a plant, chlorophyll molecules absorb light from the sun and use that energy to move around electrons. Solar cells based on photosynthesis can be smaller, cheaper, and more flexible than the ones we have now. Most of the solar cells we use now are made from layers of silicon, engineered to make them positive or negative. When the layers are sandwiched together, the space in between acts kind of like a magnet. Light energy can excite electrons, making them jump into the in-between space, and its magnetic properties push them to the other side. Once the electrons build up, the negative charge makes them push each other through the circuit, creating an electrical current we can use. Brad is making colored dyes that help the solar cell absorb even more light energy, like chlorophyll does in plants. We make more and more complex molecules for us to eventually uh, try and get a very good mimic of what the plant does. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at different pieces of a dye-sensitized solar cell, uh, showing kind of the different parts to form our solar cell. We have a very, very thin film on that. We cover that film with one of the dyes that we make that absorbs light very well. And 
And if we clipped two wires to those pieces of glass and put it in the sunlight, we'd be getting electricity out of that. It's basically a stepwise process in research. You just never know what's going to work and what doesn't work. In this case, you might need to collaborate with some other people that could give you ideas on how to do that. A lot of people have different specialties, and they might be 10,000 miles away on the other side of the earth at a different university, but they know how to solve your problem. Collaboration is an important part of solving problems. Remember that thin film Brad was talking about? That's another thing that researchers are working to improve. So Brittany, can you tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing in the lab right now? The goal of the lab right now is to make organic solar cells more efficient. And the work that I was doing to help this along was to take certain layers on a solar cell and try to make it so that they were bumpy. And what being bumpy does is it helps the interface between two surfaces have more surface area. So there's more surface area, but the two surfaces still have to be close enough together for the electrons to jump. Uh, yes, so they are limited in the distance they can move by the material that we're using. So we have to make really thin solar cells, um, but when it's really thin, you can see through it more easily. And so if you can see through it, that means the light's not getting absorbed by the material. So what we want to do is be able to have it thicker so more is absorbed um, from the sunlight and you get more power. I wanted to do some work over the summer that would give me some experience in a chemistry lab so I could actually touch some of the machines I've been learning about in class and also to work with solar cells because that's a big field in uh, optics and science. Every day, the Earth receives a huge amount of energy from the sun. And every day, we're getting better at harnessing that energy. New ideas are shared every summer as students from all over the world participate in the Solar Decathlon, a competition to see who can make the best solar-powered house. Soon, photovoltaic shingles for your house and light, flexible cells that can charge your stuff on the move will be everywhere. And someday, we might even have solar power beamed down from satellites. The National Science Foundation supports researchers who look at stuff we already know a lot about, like plants and solar cells, and think about them in new ways new ideas that could lead to a brighter tomorrow. Now if you'd like to watch this video again or learn more about discovering energy, you can visit the website www.nsf.gov slash green revolution. All right, it's time now for this week's lunch menu. This is the menu for Monday, February 23rd through March through Monday, March 2nd. On Monday, February 23rd, start the week with your choice of chicken alfredo with the breadstick, French bread pizza, or a deluxe chicken sandwich. Finish the meal off with garden peas, glazed sweet potatoes, garden salad, and mixed fruit. Then on Tuesday, February 27th, sit down with your friends and enjoy spaghetti and meatballs with a breadstick, chicken cheese steak sandwich, and a mouth-watering burger cheeseburger. On the side, you may add several appetizing items are lima beans, garden salad, and fresh fruit. On Wednesday, February 25th, battle your midday hunger by chowing down on a barbecue chicken with a roll, cheesy breadsticks, or popcorn chicken with a roll. Whichever you choose, be sure to enjoy the wonderful side items of pasta salad, NC sweet potatoes, and a garden salad and diced peaches. On Thursday, February 26th, sit down and for a wonderful meal of either a turkey club sandwich, egg rolls with fried rice, or a pepperoni pizza hoagie. Side items include oriental vegetables, a garden salad, and fresh fruit. Then, on Friday, February 27th, you won't want to miss out on lunch as your cafeteria will be serving your choice of fish nuggets, macaroni and cheese, or nachos grande. While you're in, in the lunch line, don't forget a roll or cornbread muffin, tomato and cucumber salad, garden salad, and applesauce. Finally, on Monday, March 2nd, your wait in the lunch line will be well worth it as they are serving turkey and gravy with rice, delectable corn puppies, and a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Don't forget to add sweet potato waffle fries, a garden salad, and spiced apples to the entree you choose. And there you have the lunch menu for the week. Don't forget, you can also start your day off with a healthy and hearty breakfast at school. We now have a special What's Up in Science for our, show, for our space themed show. 
In this segment, our host Dylan Grace tells us about three of the biggest stories and discoveries scientists are making in space and about our universe. Hey everybody, I'm your host Dylan Grace and welcome to this special space edition of What's Up in Science. We've had quite a few advances into the great beyond recently, so let's get started. As always, we'll start off with a technology tidbit. Researchers at the University of Colorado Boulder are attempting to build a new telescope that could take higher resolution pictures of celestial objects much further away. The Aragoscope, named after a French scientist, will be composed of lightweight parts which weren't available at the time of the Hubble telescope's launch. One way the telescope would be able to see farther would be a half-mile opaque dish which would bend light waves allowing the telescope to focus on objects that were previously blocked by the light of nearby stars. Now with the technology tidbit over, let's get to the stories. Recently, the Rosetta Comet project finally accomplished their goals of landing on a comet, uh, 67P, after a decade-long journey of traveling to the exact spot where the Rosetta spaceship would deploy the Filet lander and attempt to land on a comet traveling over 30,000 miles an hour. This mission is a first in many ways for space missions. Rosetta is the first mission following a comet over a long period, it's the first mission close to a comet, and it will be the first mission with a cometary lander. The Filet lander will also travel on the comet for over a year, gathering information as it travels all throughout space. Scientists have recently discovered a connection between a large number of galaxies near ours and have deemed this group of galaxies the Laniakea supercluster. This supercluster is 500 million light years across and contains 100,000 galaxies. The main connection between these galaxies is the Great Attractor. The Great Attractor is a gravitational force that influences the movement of all galaxies in the Laniakea supercluster. The concept of a supercluster will help astronomers make more accurate maps of the universe. Finally, the European Space Agency launched a mini space shuttle recently. The small craft was only the size of a large car, but was able to reach over 250 miles above the ground before it began its re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The craft was equipped with multiple monitor monitoring devices to see where it could be improved. Although this launch was only a test, the director of the ESA said it couldn't have gone better. A craft of this type will be necessary if interplanetary travel is to become more frequent. That's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed our space stories. Remember, always keep learning and discovering, and I'll see you in the future for another edition of What's Up in Science. Thanks, Dylan. Those are fascinating reports. They were. Just trying to comprehend how many stars and galaxies there are out there is mind-boggling. I know. It's hard to imagine the size of our own galaxy, much less tens of thousands of galaxies. It's a lot to think about. Now, as we head into our break, here is our feature on an important philosopher. This week, we look at David Hum. This segment was written and produced and edited by Laney High School senior Heather Jensen. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Philosopher David Hume is known as one of the greatest philosophers to ever write in English. He wrote in nearly every genre as a historian and essayist. He was known for his skepticism and atheism Braved in a time of religious persecution with narrow-minded and intolerant peers of the 17th century, the great Charles Darwin even regarded his work as central on the theory of evolution. Born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1711, he was raised in a well-off family. Hume entered Edinburgh College at age 10, studying Latin, Greek, and modern philosophy. He also studied large amounts of philosophical text and felt philosophy was in a bad state. Because of this, he wanted to reform it. He began his reformation with an investigation about human nature, central and empirical, meaning he wanted the investigation based on verifiable observations and truth of human nature, not theories. 
Hume said to make progress in life, reject all systems not based on facts or observation. He wanted a deeper knowledge and certainty of the ultimate reality he called truth. Hume's thesis argues that all ideas are really copied from impressions. For any idea we select, we can trace the component parts of that idea to some external sensation or internal feeling. Mental ideas are physical in nature. The mind can only operate by the organs of the body. Hume also thought the imagination, by contrast, is a faculty that breaks apart and combines ideas, forming new ones. Imagination takes our most basic ideas then leads us to form new ones. It is directed by three principles of association, resemblance, contiguity, and cause and effect. David Hume was a philosopher before his time, delving into ideas others thought were baffling and unfamiliar. This skeptic studied human nature and how we acquired knowledge. Hume was a phenomenal philosopher pushing boundaries that made him great, and for that he would always be in the history books. This is Lands and People, your passport to the world. The Republic of Angola is found on the western coast of southern Africa. The country's chief agricultural products are bananas, coffee, and sugarcane. While its major products are diamonds, iron, oil, and phosphates, most of the population belong to various Bantu groups. Angola's capital is Luanda, and primary language is Portuguese. This has been Lands and People, your passport to the world. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Rachel Glue, and my co-host is Shannon Maines. It's time for NC Happenings. Everyone should get out their pen and paper as we take a trip across the state and look at all the events taking place in the coming month. Whether you're looking for adventure or relaxation, mountains or beaches, the rhythm of city life or the tranquility of nature, there is something happening for everyone here in North Carolina. Date, March 2nd. Place, Southern Pines. Event, Classical Concert Series. Four Seasons in the Sand Hills close out the Chamber Music Festival with a performance of Four Seasons in the Sand Hill featuring world-renowned musicians. It will be an exciting time for the entire family. Tickets are $29, and if you have any questions, please call 910-692-2787 or send an email to acnc at moreart.org. Date, March 5th through March 8th. Place, Fayetteville. Event, Ain't Misbehavin'. Jump back in time to the Harlem Renaissance and dance around in tunes of Fat Waller. The Tony Award winning tour feature hits like Loungin' at the Waldro and I Can't Give You Anything But Love. Admission is between $15 and $30. If you have any questions, you can call 910-323-4234 or go to cfrt.org. Date, March 13th. Place, Oriental. Event, Chowder Cook-Off. Join the Oriental Women's Club as they compete to see who can make the best chowder. Taste chowders of every kind and see who will be the queen of the chowders. Enjoy music provided by Harbor Sounds as you sample the delicious foods. Tickets are $7. If you have any questions, please call 252-249-1161. Date, March 16th. Place, Belmont. Event, Art and Orchard, the fantasy drawings of W. Gray Smith and the world's most compelling flower, the orchid. Come together at Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden. This exclusive exhibit features the best from a collection of 5,000 orchids and the best of Smith's imagination. Be erupted in the orchid conservatory and join the kids in the children's garden. Learn to create your own art with classes and hands-on ex exhibits. Tickets are $12 for adults and $6 for children. If you have any questions, please call 704-825-4490. Date, March 25th and 26th. Place, Fontana Dam. Event, second annual Hiker Hates. Whether you're a professional mountaineer or a beginning hiker, make sure to be at Fontana Village Lodge for their second annual Hiker Haze. 
Be ready to hike the Appalachian Trail as well as play tons of fun games. Relax as you listen to music at the guitar jam sessions too. It costs $69 for an overnight lodge. If you have any questions, please call 828-498-2150 or send an email to tabitha.henry at fontanavillage.com. If these events weren't enough for you or you're looking for something different to do, then check out the website www.visitnc.com. Under the upcoming events tabs, you'll be able to sort and search for something that suits your need. It's time now for more Your School News on The Morning Show. Let's send it back over to our news anchor. Thank you, Rachel and Shannon, and welcome everyone to Your School News here on The Morning Show. The North Carolina Teacher of the Year, James E. Ford, visited Myrtle Grove faculty and presented a mini workshop on culturally competent education. Mr. Ford told the group that cultural competence is defined as a set of congruent behaviors and attitudes. Mr. Ford said the word culture is used because it implies the integrated patterns of human behavior that includes thoughts, communications, actions, customs, beliefs, values, and institutions of racial, ethnic, religious, or social groups. The word competence is used because it implies having the capacity to function in a particular way. The capacity to function within the context of culturally integrated patterns of human behavior defined by a group. Being competent in cross-cultural functioning means learning new patterns of behavior and effectively applying them in the appropriate settings. Mr. Ford said that there are five essential elements that, contribu that contribute to a system's ability to become more culturally competent. They should be reflected in attitudes, structures, policies, and services. Math is boring, right? Well, actually, no. But the way most of us are taught math certainly can be dull. To get to grips with math, you need to master the basics. And that means learning lots of simple sums by heart. 2 times 7 equals 14. 5 plus 4 equals 9. 33 divided by 3 is 11. Stuff like that. Thank goodness, then, for tablet apps that make learning basic math not only easy but fun, too. For the students at Williams Elementary, those math apps allowed them to be highly engaged in practicing their math facts and tracking their progress. Number Monster is one of the uh, very early learners. Number Monster is a simple app that teaches kids to recognize numbers from 1 through 20, we Kids Math has a whole bunch of colorful games to teach kids about numbers and basic math. And all the students love Math Bingo, which teaches all about numbers, how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. It was a great day for math education at Williams. That's all for now. To watch this week's edition of Your School News online, visit the school system's website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV logo on the homepage. Now back over to Rachel and Shannon. Thanks, Dylan. We close today's show with another exciting morning show game. This week, Shannon and I will compete to explore the solar system. That sounds fun. I've always wanted to do that. Let's send it back over to Dylan, who is, will explain how the game is played. Dylan? The rules are simple. Our contestants will have to visit all eight planets in their spacecraft. In order to move to a planet, they must answer a question about our solar system correctly. The first one to visit all the planets wins. If I happen to run out of questions, the person who traveled to the most planets wins. We flipped a coin and Shannon, you get to go first. All right, Shannon. What planet is famous for its big red spot on it? Jupiter. That is correct. Woo! Way to go. <laughs> So, do I move? Yeah, you get to move. Yeah, yeah. see, you're there. Oh, okay. You're at Mercury now. All right. I'm uh, <laughs> Rachel. Mercury. I'm what Mercury. planet Thank is you. famous for the beautiful rings that surround it? Saturn. Um, that is correct. Yeah, it's obviously. I can't see that. Well, it's there. <laughs> All right, Rachel, back to you. What planet is known as the red planet? Which no. Rachel? Oh, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon, sorry. Uh, the red right. planet, Mars. Yeah. That is correct. You're going down. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. Now, Rachel, what planet has only one moon? 
Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that for a second. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> All right, uh, Shannon. What galaxy is oh. the solar system in? Wait, which solar system? Our solar system. <laughs> in the Milky Way. That is correct. Our solar system. And a delicious candy bar. Yeah. <laughs> True that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rachel. Yeah. Which planet is closest to the sun? Mercury. That is correct. All these are really easy. <laughs> or you guys are smart. No, we're just really smart. We're smart. <laughs> AP? Earth in the All right. Uh, <laughs> Shannon. Yes. Which planet in our solar system has life? Earth! <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. Okay. Let me think. Yes. Proven yes. life. Was it, wasn't there like a worm discovered on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is correct. It is Microscopic Earth. Microscopic worm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rachel, what is the seventh planet from the sun? Oh, so yeah. That's unfair! <laughs> <laughs> I can count. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, this is the one I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is the one you didn't know. Wait, okay. It's oh, ne Neptune. <gasps> that is incorrect. No. Oh, no, I got to make it. to steal? No, no, there's no stealing. No. I got correct it answer stuff. is I, Uranus. I asked you that. You said the it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I asked you that before. You said it was wrong. Shannon? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Dylan? I, I forgot whose turn it was. What is the name of the second biggest planet in our solar system? <laughs> the second, the second biggest. This, like, what's the first biggest? Well, duh. But I, what's the second biggest? I mean, I could tell you. But no, no, no. Don't tell her. <laughs> Apparently, it's against the rules. I didn't rules. get the sixth one or the eighth one. She doesn't get the nearest one. Saturn. That is correct. Oh snap. <laughs> All right, Rachel. Hot Wheels. <laughs> Shut up. What is, the hottest, what is the hottest planet in our solar system? Mercury. Incorrect. What? <gasps> it's Venus. It's Venus, Venus. but it's close to <laughs> whatever. I give it's full of gases, obviously. <laughs> Something. Sure. Full <laughs> of gases. The solar system's in like seventh grade. Oh, well. All right, uh, I Shannon. Last week. <laughs> Which planet rotates on its side? Uranus. That is correct. How do you know these were the things? Because I took, I, I remember from fifth grade. <laughs> I don't know. All right, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Which of the planets other than Earth has an atmosphere and seasons? <gasps> I bet you know, don't you? <laughs> I have a guess. Atmosphere and seasons. This, <laughs> the little, the little yeah, diagram thank is you. not going to help you. Yeah, it is. I mean, it could help. Um, Mars. That is correct. Oh, <laughs> All right. Still really far off. <laughs> but I made it. I made Shannon. It Mars. Yeah. Uh, Still, how sure. many large groups of rings does Saturn have? Hmm. Large groups of rings? That's the question. <laughs> how many does Saturn have? Yes, how many does Saturn have? <laughs> I don't know. He said large groups. So is that like how many rings Saturn has or like large rings Saturn has? How many <laughs> large groups <laughs> of rings? Groups. Groups. Does it have like three? It's three your answer? Three is my final answer. That is incorrect. Ugh. It has seven large groups Duh. of rings. <laughs> you didn't even know. <laughs> All right. Rachel, how many planets are made of gas? <gasps> okay, well, obviously not Mercury anymore. <laughs> Five. That is incorrect. It is four. Four. Ooh. Venus. I counted four and I said five. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on without me. Big <laughs> one for the team. Uh, <laughs> Shannon. The wheel. <laughs> which planet has the greatest number of known moons in the solar system? Jupiter. That is correct. I knew that. I literally counted four and said five. <laughs> All right, Rachel. Which ones were they again? The brightest object in the sky is the sun. I was ne about to ask what is. I was like, I got this. <laughs> ne next comes the moon. The third brightest object is a planet. Name that planet. Out of all the planets? 
out of anyone oh, you can you see. Oh, you said the moon. I'm guessing that's in perspective to Earth, right? Yeah, Earth's moon. Oh, uh, okay. It's from Earth. So from Earth, then, all of them would be really bright the, wherever you're standing. Then the so we're standing on Earth. <laughs> we're standing on Earth. The <laughs> so brightest. So then the stars, <laughs> like beyond the sun. But that's the, not a the brightest object but in the sky. Oh, you said the, the brightest, brightest object, object oh. in the sky oh. is oh. the sun. Next comes the moon. Oh. The third brightest object is a planet. Name that. Oh, planet. the planet. Sorry, I missed that part. Jupiter. It is not Jupiter. Oh my goodness, it's Venus. It is Venus. <laughs> I can always see Jupiter. Shannon, in the there's sky no when stealing, so that, that can doesn't help you. Oh my god, that's why there's no stealing. I'd be like, this is from my personal experience. <laughs> as standing on Earth, I can see Jupiter in the sky every night because it's bright and it is there. How I can do you see know it. it's Jupiter. Because it's big. <laughs> <laughs> well, Venus, you can see it. <laughs> Shannon, your question. Other than that, <laughs> which planet rotates the fastest? It, like, fastest around the sun? Rotates the fastest. Like, that's orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you help her? Wow, thanks. <laughs> I know is one it, thing. <laughs> is it Pluto? It is not. No. It's Jupiter. I don't think Jupiter. Pluto's on here, is it? Is Pluto not? It, oops. No. Whoops. Apparently it's not a planet. Dwarf planet. <clears throat> uh, Rachel. Yeah. Which planet has the shortest day? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon knows it. Well, okay, I'm gonna go by logic and it's gonna be it's gonna be wrong. Is it Mercury? It is Mercury. Finally, it's Mercury. Wait, wait, can you name how long the days are? No, no but it do doesn't that? matter. It's just it's the shortest one. Can you do that? How is long? It, I think it's like 33 days. Well, we have no. Wait, very then it'd be the, then it wouldn't be the shortest day. What planet has the shortest day? Oh, the and shortest it's, day. Whoops. Yeah, it's how does how does one day 33 days? No, I was thinking <laughs> the shortest you. day All is right. 30, it's 33 days. Rachel, that Never mind. Even Rachel, make sense. 18. Which planet is closest in size to Earth? It's not my turn. It's your turn. It's my turn. Oh, Shannon. Um, which, uh, Venus? That is incorrect. No. It is Mercury. <laughs> what? There's a twin planet. Okay, well then this diagram is not up to date. <laughs> That's what my sheet says. That is, I don't believe that. That's a bunch of All funny. right. Do you also believe there's Now it's one Rachel's turn. Yeah. Uh, the That's asteroid good. belt is between what two planets? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, oh, is no. it between Mars and Jupiter? Yeah. It is between Mars and Jupiter, that is correct. But, <laughs> but nothing. <laughs> All right, uh, Shannon. Yes. What planet has the fastest winds in the solar system? Has the fastest winds? <laughs> yeah. Neptune. No, that no. is correct. Yeah! Woo! I guess on that one. Did I win? Are, are we little faces in there? All no. right, and our game winner and super space explorer <laughs> is Shannon. Congratulations. <laughs> Good game. That was really fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that does it for this edition of The Morning Show. Remember, for the best TV of all, each and every day, keep it tuned right here for New Hanover County Schools TV on the Learning Network of the Cape Fear. Have a great day. And a wonderful week.